Since Australia's economy and our property markets don't operate in isolation, I regularly have a look at the big picture, the macroeconomic factors affecting not just Australia's economy, but the world's economy to help us understand what's ahead for us. And I do this in these big picture podcasts with Pete Warchant. While regular listeners will know Pete well, if you're new to this podcast, well, firstly, welcome, because I can see there's thousands of new listeners every month to this podcast. But the reason I'm keen to discuss these matters with Pete is he's not just an academic. He's got academic credentials as a chartered accountant, chartered surveyor, and he's got a financial planning diploma. But I enjoy my chats with Pete because of his credible perspective on what's happening around the world. And since our chat last month, Australia's circumstances have rapidly evolved, so we've got lots to discuss. Welcome to today's show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. With COVID-related restrictions being lifted, life's getting back to a more COVID normal. And the pent-up demand from the last couple of months should ensure our property markets continue to perform strongly moving forward. Now, recently, Westpac upgraded its forecast for Australian dwelling prices. They now expect property values to increase 22% for the calendar year 2021 and to increase somewhere between 5 and 8% next year. Similarly, National Australia Bank have increased their forecasts for this year and next year as well. But how will APRA's intervention interfere with this? And how is all the world economic challenges, including the financial problems in China with their big property developers, how that's going to affect us here in Australia? Well, there's lots to discuss this month, so I'm looking forward to my regular big picture podcast with economic analyst Pete Wargent, a lifelong student of and commentator about our economy. Hello, Pete. Hi, Michael. Great to be back on as always. Sure. Well, you're living on the other side of the world. You're living on the other side of lockdowns, actually. As many people listening to this are getting back to normality here in Australia as we work our way through what life's going to be like. I know you're an Australian who's originally from the UK and you've been living there for a while now. So give us a bit of an insight. What can we look forward to? What's life like on the other side? I'm actually confused myself listening to that. Do I, where, where am I supposed to be living? I, I could hardly keep track with all the uh, <laughs> changes that are going on. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I've been in Europe for quite a little while. The UK actually did have restrictions related to the virus, but then they lifted all of the restrictions in July. And it's um, basically the UK equivalent of Freedom Day. So it's been pretty good, to be honest. UK summer, we've managed to travel to the Algarve, we've been to Crete. So, so it might sound quite unusual if you've been in the Melbourne lockdown for a few months, but the UK went through its lockdown earlier and we came out the other side. Now, as uh, Europe goes into winter, there's actually still quite a lot of cases around, but everyone who wants a vaccine has had two shots and generally people are just getting on with life now. And it's not been anything like as newsworthy now. The news cycle has kind of moved on after two years. That's good to hear because I think a lot of us are sick of hearing the same thing in the news every day. Look, we're moving in the same direction. Fully vaccinated Australian citizens and residents are allowed to fly into New South Wales uh, from the 1st of November. It sounds like Victoria is going to follow through as well. And this should provide a, a strong boost to at least Sydney's economy and I guess Victoria's once uh, Victoria opens up, Pete. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think this is something we've seen all around the world is that Nobody was really clear what would happen relating to lockdowns. It's not something we're really used to in the modern economies, but stimulus packages have plugged their gap, so to speak. And of course, if you restrict people from doing stuff, they only want to do it more. So when you reopen, you get this kind of big boom, like a hedonistic uh, trade that opens up and everybody goes to restaurants and the pubs and the cinemas and all the rest of it. So I'm pretty sure we will see that in Sydney and Melbourne over the coming months and as we know, household balance sheets, um, households are sitting on one and a half trillion dollars of cash. We've never seen anything like that before. So there's a lot of pent up demand there waiting to come bursting out. 
Sure. Well, before we discuss a bit more about what's happening in Australia, let's start with the big picture and what's happening in the world economy. And recently, the International Monetary Fund amended its global economic forecasts. It says that the global economy is going to continue to recover, even as the pandemic is resurging and Europe's going into its winter. As always, there's always going to be winners and losers. And it seems those countries who've been vaccinating their population, they're likely to be doing better than the less developed countries. Yes, I think there's basically one really big story that's going to dominate 2022 for global economies and central banks, and that's inflation. We've been used to low inflation now for a dozen years, and suddenly we've got energy prices uh, through the roof, so oil, gas. If you've got clients who are doing construction or developments, you'll know there's been materials shortages. So around the world, uh, the New Zealand central bank has hiked interest rates. It looks like the Bank of England might be next to go. In Australia, the Reserve Bank has said, look, we're not going to hike interest rates, at least until 2024. We want to see wages growth returning and all the rest of it. But we're just starting to see some pressures there around the world in terms of inflation. In fact, we even saw some mortgage rates just going up 10 basis points this week. So I think that'll be the really big story next year. I think, though, it's sometimes um, we talk a bit about the big picture and hence the name of the podcast. I think something that for property people to just bear in mind, keep a sense of perspective. There's all media loves these stories about rising interest rates. But remember that the five year bond yield in Australia is like 1.2%, and the 10 year bond yield is like 1.8%. So, in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, you're not talking about big moves in interest rates. They just could go a bit higher from where they are. Sure. And the inflation is occurring because our economies are picking up, but they're starting from a low base. The Reserve Bank says they want to make sure inflation remains at the level of between 2 and 3%, not just there once, and also wages growth to, to, to increase, Pete. Yes, absolutely. So at the moment, we've got the cash rate at 0.1%, record low. Also, the Reserve Bank is targeting the 2024 bond at the same level. So effectively depressing interest rates across the curve. But a lot of talk now about whether the Reserve Bank should stop doing that and maybe even start thinking about hiking interest rates. All of the rhetoric from Martin Place is, look, the recovery is only just beginning. Let's see if we can get some sustained wages growth in the economy, which I take to mean 3% or above. At the moment, wages growth is 1.7%. And for the June quarter, it was 0.4. So there's a long way to go, I think, before we actually start seeing genuine and sustainable wages growth, which is what the Reserve Bank wants to see. Sure. Well, recently, Westpac chief economist Bill Evans, with their forecast for 2022, said our economy is going to grow really strongly next year, 7% economic growth. And if he's right, that will put pressure for interest rates to increase. And he keeps saying that the Reserve Bank's wrong interest rates are going to increase in 2023, not 2024. I mean, that would be good in some ways if wages do go up and if uh, the economy is doing well and inflation is there. It also means the value of our homes will have gone up and we'll be a little bit wealthier all around. Yeah, I mean, let's let's be honest, though. It's a bit of a fool's errand trying to predict what's going to happen over two and three years, given that we still have an ongoing global pandemic. So at the moment, everything's reopening. But, you know, if cases start rising and there could be pressures on restrictions again, there's a lot of things that could happen over the next couple of years. As you said, if the economy grows 7% next year, happy days. You know, that means things are recovering. We're back towards full employment and we're getting back on an even keel. But uh, I think there's a few hurdles between here and there. Of course, while the Reserve Bank may not change the cash rate, the banks, they could, as they've done in the past, do an out-of-cycle interest rate rise. In other words, they'll raise their interest rates to consumers, even though the cost of the the cash rate from the Reserve Bank doesn't change. Because in the background, the cost of their money is slowly creeping up, isn't it? So I think we're just starting to see some of the lenders just nudging up their fixed rates. So don't forget, fixed mortgage rates have been at the lowest level in history in Australia. So it's not completely surprising if fixed mortgage rates go from 2% to 2.1 or something like that. I mean, it's not really newsworthy in many senses. It's just maybe it's indicating that we've seen the bottom of the cycle for interest rates, which I think we probably have. 
but at the moment we're not seeing anything meaningful so um I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens over the next year or two, but I don't think it's much to get panicked about. When we're getting back to the big picture again, one of the newsworthy items for the last couple of months has been China's big property developer, Evergrande, Evergrande, I've heard them call it both names, going bust, uh, and the fallout that could occur from that. Pete, not just for the property developers, it looks like China's government is attacking its corporations, Alibaba and others, and in the process has thrown the international bond debt holders into a bit of a panic. Yeah, it's a really interesting story, this one. So, of course, the, the media headlines a few weeks ago immediately jumped to, is this uh, China's Lehman moment uh, reflecting the Lehman Brothers collapse? I mean, in, in the sim- most simplistic terms, no, not really, because this is a property developer. It's not a bank. There's some very big numbers. You know, you're talking about huge you know, billions of dollars in uh, liabilities there. So 300 billion, apparently, in liabilities. Yes, across you know spread right across um, all of those cities. So look, it's a it's a very big big issue. Now I guess you know in China things work a bit differently. I guess there'll be a restructure. Uh, some of the bondholders will take a haircut, and maybe the government will intervene. Things have gone very quiet on this story. There were you know red hot headlines a few weeks ago. Now things are very quiet, and it would be tempting to think that things have gone away. But one of the things they always say particularly in uh, Queensland property, is that there's never just one cockroach. So I think it's one of those stories you just have to wait and see how it evolves and who's taking the hits on these bond defaults and are there any repercussions for the wider market? Sure, because as you correctly say, it's not just Evergrande, but there's a number of other developers there. And it'll be interesting to see what the Chinese government's policy is. It has been trying to slow down speculation and to some degree it's been trying to slow down capitalism. And while people think China is a communist country, it really isn't when you travel there and you see how many private enterprises there are, Pete. No, and I remember you said um, a couple of years ago when you were over in China, you said exactly that. It's not the sort of communist country that you sort of um, equate with Eastern Europe uh, when I was growing up. It's now, um, it's a very rapidly urbanizing sort of hybrid model, I guess, because uh, there's uh, capitalism is thriving in part. And particularly that massive urbanization push, um, you know, you're talking about hundreds of millions of people either relocating to the cities or being swallowed up by the cities. And that that has obviously created an, an enormous demand for Australia's commodities, particularly iron ore and coal. And of course, the relationship between Australia and China at the moment is currently very strained. So there's a lot of unknowns there about what happens with our uh, resources exports, but also what happens with the international students, because I've, obviously many of them have come from China in recent years. And Chinese tourism has been a huge boom over the past decade for Australia. So there's probably some relationship tension there that might need to be resolved. Sure. Well, iron ore is now not being used as much, and that may affect those exports and particularly the Western Australian economy. It seems like China's uh, power problems, they're requiring to create more power, more electricity, is going to require more of our coal, and that'll help others of our exporters. Yeah, this is um, a very contentious issue, particularly coming into an election year. Australia's coal exports have been very, very lucrative over the past decade. You know, we constructed a lot of mines through the early years of the resources boom, and then the exports went through the roof, um, especially to China. Uh, But of course, now climate and uh, the net zero push, um, that is probably one of the salient topics at the moment, and especially going into an election year. That is a very um, heavily debated subject, and it's a difficult one for Australia because it's been such a a lucrative time. Now, we're not building new coal mines at the moment uh, in the same way that we were, but obviously I think that push towards net zero is going to gather pace, I think, in the years to come. Oh, that'll be one of those stories that's not going to go away for a long time. One last thing about China, I noticed they're wanting to know who's got the money. Is that why they hate crypto, Pete, and why they've made dealing in cryptocurrencies a criminal offence? Yeah, look, cryptocurrency, I mean, the Chinese authorities, they don't like things going on where there's not much uh, central control. And obviously, that's part of the point of cryptocurrency transactions is that they work independently of central banks and so on. 
I mean, it seems to be a new story every second week that China has banned cryptocurrency and transactions in crypto. They're obviously not keen on the uh, the model. That in itself is a rapidly evolving space. More regulation is coming, I think, um, including in the US. It'll be an interesting thing to watch. Okay, let's get back to Australia. We mentioned before that there's a significant war chest. Some are suggesting two hundred billion dollar war chest. Household savings are expected to reach that because in the two largest cities in particular, but around Australia, people have been kept indoors. We've been spending less, but now we're being let loose. So that's going to be a boost to our economy. I see the other boost to our economy, Pete, being all the construction that has just started. When you look at all the new building starts, that's going to keep that part of the economy going for quite a few months. Yeah, I think this is one of the most underappreciated aspects of the lockdown is that the government put in place all these um, stimulus packages, not just in Australia, overseas as well. The UK had its furlough schemes, Australia had JobKeeper and JobSeeker and all the others, the home builder stimulus. I think what was less well appreciated is that particularly over the past 10 or 15 years, Australians like to travel. We like to go overseas and have expensive holidays and that option was basically shut off for most of us. And so all of those dollars have been trapped at home. People have been somewhat wary about buying new cars because of the, I suppose, the shift towards electronic vehicles. People are a bit, you know, uncertain about what to do in terms of buying new vehicles, which is the other traditional place that uh, people spend their cash and their windfalls. Uh, So that's kind of left property as the place for money to go and the stock market to a secondary degree. Uh, So renovations have really taken off. A lot of people have gone towards buying investment property. And as you mentioned, the home builder stimulus has kicked off this massive detached house building boom. And that's not just in Sydney and Melbourne or Brisbane, that's right across the country. So uh, there's a lot going on in that respect as well. Over the month, there's been news of 281,000 Australians losing their job because of Delta. Now, this is rear vision, looking into the rear vision mirror, because the most recent Australian Bureau of Statistics results show the lockdowns in August and uh, July, uh, a lot of people lost their jobs. But more recently, uh, the jobs on SEEK have increased considerably. So I guess people are starting to gear up for opening up their industries. Yeah, I think those uh, some of the labour force figures, they're a bit sort of artificial or warped at the moment because of the lockdowns. I mean, the unemployment rate is still under 5%, the, the official Amazing, isn't rate. it? Yeah, incredible. But then, you know, the participation rate's down, hence the headline employment figures are also lower. But as you mentioned, I mean, only uh, yesterday, the government uh, Department of Employment put out its uh, labour market information portal vacancies figures, bit of a mouthful. I mean, 229,000 on the skilled vacancies list. I mean, that's a huge number. I mean, New South Wales and Victoria, uh, their vacancies are about 25% higher than they were pre-COVID. But if you look at Queensland and Western Australia, uh, South Australia, Tasmania, up in the territory, they're way high, you know, 50% plus higher than what we had pre-COVID. So there's a big hiring boom about to take place. And I think you'll probably see that all those jobs that, Uh, were nominally lost in recent months will come roaring back. And I think we'll see employment back above 13 million and a record highs pretty quickly, probably by Christmas. Getting on to property, Australia's property market grew by about $1 billion in six months, according to CoreLogix figures. The total value of all Australian residential real estate is now over $9 trillion when it was only $8 trillion back in April or so. Unlike previous booms, this one's been driven mainly by owner-occupiers, not investors. Investors are starting to come into the market. Now, I I saw some projections if it kept growing at the same rate, we'd be at $10 trillion by April. But the property markets are now slowing and APRA's um, going to make sure that we're not going to keep growing at the same rate. Yeah, I was just going to say, actually, I think there's two other big issues for property next year. One you just mentioned, APRA. Uh, so they've already made a move. There's a 3% buffer rate now if you apply for a new mortgage. So uh, lenders will stress test you, assuming that interest rates go up by 3%, which is probably not going to happen this lifetime. But anyway, it's a, it's a mechanism to slow down lending a little bit and uh, maybe just reduce the amount that people are borrowing. 
Uh, I think, though, there, there could be further controls come in next year, particularly for high debt-to-income borrowers and potentially uh, high LVR, that's loan-to-value ratio borrowers as well. So there could be a bit more to come there next year. So that will be a slowing factor for the housing market as well. As well, there'll be more uh, stock come onto the market. Things naturally tend to cool. Things do go in a cycle. It's just those immutable laws of supply and demand. I think the other really big issue and again, going into an election year, is what happens to immigration? I think there's a lot of debate now. We've been through this um, sort of really unusual or artificial shutdown with no immigration. And people are saying, well, do we need to import millions of people to make up for the the lost time and the skilled vacancies? Do we need to lift the immigration cap from 160,000 to 200,000 a year? I see the New South Wales government, it was leaked to take an advice that they, they might need to bring in 2 million immigrants over five years nationwide. So, I mean, that is a debate that's going to come right into focus very soon. I mean, I suspect um, the 2 million figure is probably an opening gambit and uh, the figures might end up being lower than that. But I wouldn't be surprised if the pace of immigration is picked up to, say, 200,000 permanent migrants per annum from the previous cap of 160. Well, we know in the past that when migrants come in, especially for the skilled jobs, skilled job migrants, which is what we're talking about, they're going to go to the big capital cities, which is where a lot of the jobs are. It's hard to get them to go to regional Australia or South Australia. And if they do, and they're there for a limited period of time, as soon as that period's up, they tend to go to the big smoke. That's only going to put more pressure on the the shortage of supply in our big capital cities. Yes, and I, don't forget, I've had a bit of a sneak preview here being over in Europe. So I, I guess one of the things I've observed in recent weeks and months is that even though restrictions have been removed, uh, some people are quite cautious still about um, COVID and virus gathering in crowds. And people have, by and large, steered clear of going on the tube. Uh, the buses are empty. The trains aren't as busy. But the traffic is appalling. So, and I think Sydney is finding this already. So, assuming we see some similar trends in Australia, what does that mean for property? Well, if I was an investor, I'd probably be looking at properties and rentals that were close to train links or, you know, places where you can easily get to the city. I think if you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere with a long drive commute, um, I think, I mean, those markets could be quite awkward to find tenants because. We know Sydney traffic is bad at the best of times. And if people are a bit wary about uh, getting onto buses and things like that, well, it could only add to the traffic congestion. That makes sense. In fact, having all those extra people are going to bring lots more cars on the roads. And already, according to Google, traffic in Sydney, for all the reasons you just said, is higher than it was pre-pandemic because people are wary about going on public transport. You also mentioned that APRA's likely to introduce further macro prudential controls. I agree with you. They've only really just tapped the brake at the moment. They haven't put the handbrake on. So our property markets are going to slow down from maybe being red hot uh, to maybe from sixth gear to third or fourth gear, but they're still going to go on. So what's it going to look like for APRA when in three, four months at the end of this year, early next year, the markets have moved up another quantum? They're going to look a bit silly unless they do something else. Yeah, I think it was uh, partly a signal. I think it was a, a sort of a, a warning shot or a chop across the bowels, as they say. But I, I think uh, it wasn't really designed to do too much. And I think it was a good move in some ways. It would probably reduce borrowing capacity by maybe 3 to 5% for some borrowers. So it does something at the margin. But I guess at the end of the day, when you've got record low mortgage rates, it's not going to stop the property market in its tracks. And that wasn't the design, I'm sure. But yes, if the market keeps moving quickly, then further measures might be warranted. But I guess the regulators will be hoping that the market cools naturally over the Christmas break and things are a bit more balanced next year. Well, despite property values having increased around 20% and in some cases more this year, they've been flat over much of the time from the previous peak in 2017. So the market's really playing catch up to some degree. It's really been a short upturn and boom phase of this property cycle. But if you even it out over the last four years or so, it hasn't been remarkable annualised growth. No, not if you go back from, say, 2017. It's um, an interesting argument in 
uh, in terms of whether you should try and time the market or whether you just accept that you're just going to have the most time in the market that you can get because you know there's been a lot of predictions made over the last five or six years but you would have been hard pressed to to pick some of the the things that have happened there was a big intervention from APRA I guess around about as that time that you mentioned around 2017 through to the 2019 election then things took off again then things uh, crashed or stopped in their tracks with COVID and now they're booming again and I think uh, you'd have to be a pretty skillful market timer to pick some of those turning points. Well, I think one of the lessons out of COVID, but of the last years, or you and my many years in the market, is just don't try and time it. Have a look at the predictions made by people who are, in theory, much cleverer than you and me, all the big bank economists who got it so wrong. They've really done a 180-degree turn on where the property markets are going to be, what's going to happen to unemployment. We spoke only a minute ago about unemployment having a figure with a four in front of it. it. wasn't that long ago. Everyone was predicting unemployment in double-digit figures and property values dropping 10 15 20%. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I remember reading years ago, I think it was uh, possibly in your first book, where you said, I look for suburbs and locations with a proven track record of capital growth because that shows that the dynamic is there there's more demand than supply you know these landlocked suburbs and then if you're taking a 10-year view well as i said earlier on the 10-year bond yield in australia is is under two percent so we might see some hikes over the coming years but you're not talking about high mortgage rates anytime over the next decade so therefore look for those locations landlocked limited supply high demand good school zones, flood free, like a lot of it is common sense. But I think that point on the proven track record is an important one. You've got to look for those locations with a dynamic which forces capital growth. Well, I guess what you're saying is look for areas that have always performed rather than for the next hotspot. We've seen how they've performed. I've enjoyed my chat with you and it's always interesting just to get your great perspective on what's happening in the world. You have a regular blog. You've got your own podcast now as well. If people want to find out more about the way you're thinking about what's happening in the world and the economy, how do they find out about you, Pete? Uh, well, uh, my daily blog is Pete Wardgen Blogspot, or you can track me down at PeteWardgen.com. And I'll have to get you on my Pete Wardgen Property Podcast, Michael. Uh, be a very popular guest, I'm sure. I look forward to that. It'll be interesting to be on the other side of the microphone. We'll catch up again real soon for the next Big Picture podcast. Thank you, Pete. I look forward to that. I'll give you a grilling. (laughs) Okay, great. Thank you. Cheers. In a moment, I'm going to share my popular mindset message with you. But before I do, just following on from my discussion with Pete, I think it's important to recognise that moving forward, not all properties are going to increase in value the same. In fact, we're in for a two-tier property market moving forward. While most property markets around Australia have performed strongly so far this year, well, other than those inner-city high-rise apartments, it's important to realise, as I said, that now with affordability and the changes that APRA are bringing around, as uh, Pete and I were discussing, we're likely to have a two-tier market. In other words, Properties located in the inner and middle ring suburbs, particularly in the gentrifying areas, are likely to outperform cheaper properties in the outer suburbs. While the outer suburbs are more affordable, affordability is now going to be more of an issue with those people who have limited wages growth. More than that, though, there are other challenges to various segments of our property market. So the point I'm trying to make is you can't just buy any property now. The rising tide won't lift all ships. And if you'd like some guidance and direction about where to invest, what you can do, that's going to depend upon your personal budget. It's going to depend upon your plans. It's going to depend upon where you are in your property investment journey. Why not have a chat with my team at Metropole? We always start by putting a strategic plan together for you. And remember, we don't have any properties for sale, which means our advice is independent and unbiased. Go to metropole.com.au, find out a bit more about what we do, and why not have my team as part of your wealth creation journey? Hey, by the way, we just won another international award as Australia's leading property consultants. So metropole.com.au and let us help 
formulate a plan to get you to where you want to get to, and then you may choose to use our buyer's agents, our wealth advisory, financial planning, or many of our other divisions. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's Mindset Moment, I'd like to share with you six things successful people only do once. You know, they they say there's a definition of insanity and it's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If you make a big mistake, have a negative experience, and you return to the same situation hoping to get a different outcome, then you're doomed for failure, aren't you? So much of the drama that people go through in their careers, in their personal life, in their investing is avoidable if they listen to the signs the first time around. Now, not with all things, mind you. I mean, accidents happen, ill health happens. Of course, they can't avoid those. But so much else can be avoided. And yet we see people, sometimes people very close to us, in these emotional roundabouts and dead ends, and they're hoping for a different outcome. So let's look at six things successful people only ever do once because they learn not to do them again and see where you fit in. The first thing is they only trust the wrong people once. I remember reading something from an American writer who once said, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Now, there's a message in that. It's a great saying because it touches on what we know to be true. Yet sometimes we ignore our gut instinct about certain people and it can get us into hot water. Pay attention to those who you work with, who work for you. And if they don't add anything to your life or your business, but in particular if they cause chaos and problems, don't excuse it. Don't excuse their behavior. The second thing successful I need to once and then they learn, is mishandling money. Becoming good at handling money through saving, through investing, through getting involved in real estate, through projecting forward. It's a skill. It actually is. It can be learned. And that's why I spend time teaching you how to do it. And of course, we all make mistakes along the way. But smart people take money seriously. and They pay attention to it. Again, it doesn't mean they get everything right. But it does mean that whenever they're careless with it, They learn. They never say, oh, it doesn't matter. The third thing they only do once is to forget about the long-term reward. On the road to success, sometimes it's easy to forget and occasionally you need to make some tough decisions and go without something in the short term for the benefit of the long term. Interestingly, this is a theme that comes up a lot, isn't it, as we have a chat, and it's the concept of delayed gratification. If you make decisions based on what you may think feels good in the moment, then it's very likely you're going to fail to take care of your long-term plans. Maybe you say yes to something just to keep the peace, but it's not the right path. Don't do that. It can really throw a spanner in the works. Another thing that successful people only do once because they've learned is to ignore their values. Look, all of us have got an innate sense of what's right and what's wrong. We've also got boundaries on what's acceptable behavior on what we will and what we won't agree to. Successful people don't ignore this internal value system. They know, maybe even from making this sort of mistake once or twice, they know the high personal price that's paid when you go against your own values. Something else successful people only do once because they've learned, is they don't badmouth others. You may be in competition with somebody you dislike. You may even have a very good reason for disliking them. But successful people don't badmouth others in business, in life. They know it looks petty, and it's a sign of poor character. It also shows that rather than focusing on the work at hand, they're focusing on trashing others' reputation. Now, that's not a good look. And the other thing successful people only do once is ignore the detail. It's so important to check the detail and analyze the deal, ask questions, check the fine print. A healthy skepticism is just that, healthy and wise. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. So it's really important not to put your head in the sand. If you're not strong on detail, you better surround yourself with people who are. So the bottom line 
for today's mindset message is sometimes half the struggle of being successful is acting it. If you pay attention to your gut, to your intuition, if you don't badmouth others, if you're rigorous with detail, if you trust your instinct, if you surround yourself with the right people, you're going to be well on the way to success. As we get close to the end of another show, I want to say thank you for spending the last half an hour or so with me. And my way of saying thank you to you, if you haven't already taken advantage of the offer, is to go to podcastbonus.com.au. I'll leave a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where I've got a heap of reports and ebooks for you. I'll be back again real soon, but you can catch me in between these regular twice weekly shows. Just chase me on social media, look for Michael Yardney, or join my private Facebook group where every day I leave some tips and some information that you won't get elsewhere be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing, and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 